Hi, welcome to Algebra 2 Common Core. Today we're going to be talking about domain and range of functions, but first we need to review some of the notations that we used back in Algebra 1. The first notation that you should be familiar with is called set builder notation. We're going to draw a few examples of set builder notation. If we have, for example, the set of all x such that x is greater than or equal to 3. We want to be able to draw this on a number line so that we know what the numbers it represents. So I'm going to make my number line and I see that 3 is an anchor point for this number line. Sometimes I like to start at zero as long as my anchor point is close enough to my zero point. So I'm going to put three on there. Now the numbers that we want to shade will be all the numbers that are greater than or equal to three. So that means the three is included in the set. I'm going to put an open circle at three but then fill it in showing that three is part of my set. I want to shade all the numbers greater than or equal to 3, so I've shaded the equal to. Now I want to shade to the right, showing all numbers greater than or equal to 3. So my set should look like this. Let's try another one in set builder notation. What if we have the set of all x such that, that vertical line just is read as such that. This time I'm going to put the x in the middle of my, do, my uh, definition. I'm going to read this direction backwards. I want x greater than 0, but going this direction, less than 4. So in essence, I want all values of x that are between 0 and 4. Notice that this time the endpoints, the 0 and the 4, are not included in my set. I'm going to show that on my number line. So I want to draw all the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And then on my number line I'm going to show that 0 is my left endpoint. 4 is my right end point. I'm putting open circles at the 0 and the 4 because 0 and 4 are not included in the set. I can tell that because my inequalities this time are less than. They don't have an equals as part of them. Let's shade in between. So I'm going to get a little bit thicker marker here and shade everything from 0 to 4 but not including the endpoints. The other kind of notation that we need to be familiar with is called interval notation. Interval notation uses parentheses and square brackets to tell the beginning and ending value of the set. For example, A, I am going to use the square bracket from negative 2 to 3, and I'm going to also close with a square bracket. To graph this interval, my number line will have to have the number negative 2, but it will have to go up to the number 3. The square bracket tells me that the endpoints are included in the interval. So I'm going to put the closed circle at negative 2, closed circle at 3, and again I'm going to make my marker a little bit thicker here, and I'm going to shade everything between negative 2 and 3, including the endpoints. For my next example, using interval notation. Let's have the interval from negative infinity up to negative 1. Notice for this example I'm denoting that the endpoints 
are not included, there are parentheses at the endpoints. Whenever I have an infinity or a negative infinity on an endpoint, I can never include them in the set, so they should always have parentheses. I have to put negative 1 on my number line. I know that 0 would be the next point, but that's not actually part of my set. Negative infinity means that my set is going to start way back here at negative infinity. It's going to go all the way up to negative 1, but I'm not going to include the negative 1, so I'm going to put an open circle at negative 1. I want to shade everything from negative infinity up to negative 1, not including the negative 1. So I'm going to stop so that it's clear that I have an open circle at negative 1. Let's try one more of these sets. Let's say that we are going from 5 up to infinity. For this set, you'll notice that my 5 has an open bracket, a parentheses, so that tells me my starting point is going to be 5, but the 5 is not included in the set, so I'm going to put an open circle at 5. Because I want to start at 5, I want everything shaded to the right of 5, and I'm going to keep going until I make it to infinity, which of course just means very large values on the right end of my number line. So my number line should look like this. Now we can also see, and I might add one more example here. Let me erase that, that's a little thick. I'm going to add one more example, and the example that I'm going to add is going to be one that has a square bracket on the left, negative 1, and a curve bracket on the right after 4. This is sometimes called a half open, oops, I said that wrong, half closed, half open interval. So when I go to make my number line, my first endpoint, negative 1, is included. So that means I'm going to make a filled-in circle at negative 1. But when I count over to 4, that one is not going to be included, and I know that because I've got a curve parentheses there. Now I'm going to fill in everything in between the two, and notice that negative 1 is included in the set, but 4 is not. Let's go ahead to exercise 1, where we're going to convert between set builder notation and interval notation, as well as graphing on the number line. So we're given the set builder notation x such that x is greater than or equal to negative 3, but less than or equal to 2. You'll notice that in this example, we're using two dots to stand for the such that. means exactly the same thing. So I am going to go ahead and draw a number line, and I'm going to include negative 3 on the left side, counting up to 0 and then positive 2. Because I see that I have a greater than or equal to and a less than or equal to sign, that tells me that the endpoints are both included. So I'm going to fill in a circle at negative 3 and fill in a circle at 2. When I go ahead to shade, I can see that I want to make sure that I am shading everything between negative 3 and 2, including both endpoints. Now, when I want to write this in interval notation, this just means write the square bracket from negative 3 up to 2. I'm putting square brackets on both ends because I want to include both endpoints. Looking at exercise number two, this time I'm given interval notation. 
and I want to write an equivalent set builder notation as well as graph it on the number line. I see that my target points are negative 1 and 4, so I go ahead and put those on my number line. I notice that at negative 1, I've got a curve bracket, so that tells me do not include that number. 4 also has a curve bracket, so I'm not including that number. Both of those points have to have an open circle. Now, because my interval begins at negative infinity, when I go ahead and shade this, I'm going to start by shading way to the left side and keep going up to negative 1, but don't shade the negative 1. Because my second part of the interval starts at 4 and goes to infinity, that tells me that I want to shade starting at 4, but not including 4, and going all the way to the right-hand end. Now when I write this in set builder notation, remember that set builder notation has to have the brackets. So the brackets means that I'm going to write my x such that I've got two separate shadings, so I'm going to have two separate inequalities. The first one is going to be x is less than negative 1. I'm going to put the word OR in between because there aren't any uh, points that are shaded on both sides. My second half is going to be X is greater than 4. So I've got two parts to this inequality because I have two separate sections shaded. Now I'd like for you to go ahead and try these U triads. You'll have to write them first of all in the box on your note sheet and then pause the video so that you can draw the number lines and write the second set in set builder notation. Welcome back. Please check your solutions for these you try it. If you have any questions, please come and see me in the morning. This brings us to the definitions for domain and range. The domain should be the set of all input values that result in an output. So the domain is really just the set of all x values for your function. The range is the set of all output values. This of course is the set of all y values for our function. So we're going to practice finding domain and range in the next few exercises. For exercise number one, it says state the range of the function, where the function is f of n is equal to 2n plus 1, if the domain is given as the set 1, 3, and 5. Then show this domain and range in the mapping diagram. So to find our range, we're going to have to use each input in our function. So for example, we want to find the function value at 1, or the output at 1. Substituting 1 in for n, I'm going to say 2 times 1 plus 1, which of course gives me the answer of 3. For the function value at 3, that's going to be 2 times 3 plus 1, which gives me an output of 7. For the function value at 5, that's going to be 2 times 5 plus 1, which gives me an output of 11. So our domain is the numbers 1, 3, and 5. We've set those up in our set for the domain of f. The range are the outputs 3, 7, and 11.
you'll notice that for these three, they are matched with a member of the domain. We're going to show that matching or that mapping using arrows. So one is mapped to the number three, three is mapped to the number seven, and five is mapped to the number 11. For exercise number two, we're going to find the domain and range of the function g of x by looking at the graph given to us. For the domain, we want to be sure that we are looking at all possible x values. Notice that first of all we want to find the domain and range in interval notation. I'm going to abbreviate domain with a capital letter D. So when I look at my graph, I see that my graph begins at an x value of negative 3. I see that my graph ends at an x value of 6. So that tells me that my domain is all of the numbers from negative 3 to 6. Because I've got endpoints at negative 3 and at 6, and those endpoints are solid dots, that means that negative 3 and negative 6 are included in my domain. So that tells me to put a square bracket around those two numbers. To do the range, we're going to look at a similar format, but this time we're going to be looking at the y values. So for this one, I'm going to say, let's look at my lowest y value. So the lowest value is down here. If I count that out, I see that my lowest y value is negative 5. Then I look to the highest y value, and I see that right across here is going to be my highest y value. When I count that on the y-axis, I see that it goes up to 4. Again, because on my graph I have points at those y values, that tells me that I need to include both negative 5 and 4 in my range, so I'm going to put square brackets around them. Now I need to convert both of these answers over to set builder notation. So my domain, the numbers from negative 3 to 6 in set builder notation would be the set of all x such that I'm going to put the x in the middle. And remember, I have to read from right to left when I'm going to the lower endpoint. So I'm going to say x is greater than or equal to negative 3. Going the other direction, I want to go all the way up to the number 6, so x is less than or equal to 6. I'm using equals in each of those inequalities because negative 3 and 6 are both included in the set. I can also read this as x is all numbers between negative 3 and 6 including the endpoints because of this inequality. I'm going to do a similar procedure for the range. So the range, instead of being x, we're going to call that y. So it's the set of all y such that y is greater than or equal to negative 5 and y is less than or equal to 4. So I can be asked for the domain and range in either interval notation or set builder notation. So I need to be familiar with both. In exercise number three, we are given a graph of a parabola. The function f of x is equal to x squared minus 2x minus 3. We want to use that graph and determine what is the domain and the range. When I look at the domain for this one, I see that the graph has arrows on the ends. Now that ar those arrows, first of all, tell me that the graph keeps going in the upward direction. But the other thing that it tells me is that the graph also keeps going as the x's are getting bigger and as the x's are getting smaller. This graph keeps getting wider and wider as my graph gets bigger. Because of that, that tells me that my domain is going to include all the numbers on the x-axis. Because it includes all the numbers on the x-axis, I want to say that the domain is going to be all values of x 
such that x is a value from negative infinity to infinity. So my domain would look like this. Now check the range for this multiple choice question. I see that my low point on my graph is this y value, negative 4. See that the negative 4 is included in the set. Because my graph again has arrows on the ends, I see that the y values keep going all the way to infinity. So the range for this function would be the square bracket from negative 4 to infinity. So I know that my solution, my multiple choice answer for this one, should be multiple choice number 3. As you finish your notes for tonight, take a look at the think question. What will we need to consider when we're trying to find the domain of the function f of x is equal to the square root of x minus 3? Think about what values of x are going to make this function work and which values of x will give me an answer that's not real. How about the function g of x? g of x is equal to x over x plus 1. Is there any value of x that doesn't work in this function? So when we're thinking about domain, we have to consider all possible values of x and see if possibly there are some x values that do not work in a particular function. Tomorrow night's video will focus on restrictions on domains of functions. Have a great night and we'll see you tomorrow.